we should read. Okay. I don't want to move anything on the table. Hmm? Yeah, cause everything Are we all ready? Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah, everyone happy? All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, seeing with the closing of the doors, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So, uh, good afternoon. My name is Jeff Bream. I'm the acting branch chief for the cybersecurity branch in the NRC's Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response. I want to thank you all for joining us to, at today's discussion titled Two Decades of Nuclear Cybersecurity, What Does the Future Hold? Uh, in this session, we will explore the past two decades of cybersecurity requirements and implementation in the nuclear industry. The presenters will discuss the initial cybersecurity requirements and how they were built on to establish the robust requirements that are in place today. The session will also explore where cybersecurity goes from here, addressing the cybersecurity challenges associated with the application of novel technologies and the operation of SMRs, uh, small modular reactors, and microreactors. Uh, presenters will discuss agency research, both planned and ongoing, to support cybersecurity licensing and oversight of these applications. I'll ask uh, each of the presenters to briefly introduce themselves and their affiliation. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Anya Kim, and I'm with the NRC in the Office of Research, and I'm with the Instrumentation Controls and Electrical Engineering Branch. Uh, good afternoon. Paul Shanes. I'm with the UK's Office for Nuclear Regulation. I'm the Professional Lead for Cybersecurity. Good afternoon. My name is Rich Magabro from the Nuclear Energy Institute. I'm the Director of Security and Incident Preparedness. Hello, my name is Kim Lawson Jenkins. I'm in the cybersecurity branch of the Division of Physical and Cybersecurity Policy in the Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response. Uh, before we get started with the presentations, just a couple of the general housekeeping. The Wi-Fi code for attendance or for attendance of the RIC is uh, RIC R RIC 2024. Uh, please remember to silence your electronic devices, and all sessions are being video recorded. Uh, for the QA portion of this session, we'll, we'll be through electronic means for both the virtual and in-person attendees. For those of you in session in this room, please, the QR code that was displayed a moment ago um, is how you can submit your questions. For those joining virtually, there should be a box to the right of the screen so you can enter your question in directly. Um, at this time, as I will pass on to our first presenter, uh, Anya Kim. Well, hello again, everybody. I hope you can hear me. So it's pretty late in the afternoon. It's the last session of the day, and I'm sure a lot of us are flagging, and some of us are even jet lagging, I'm sure. So let's uh, see if we can do a little brain exercise. I'm going to, why don't you read this title? And then see if you can recall it when I ask you for it like, in a few minutes. <laughs> um, but, but first of all, let me just point out, so changing nuclear cybersecurity landscape, that's, that's a mouthful. But it also leads to really interesting cybersecurity research ideas. And today I'll be talking about some of those cybersecurity topics that the NRC is exploring within this um, changing landscape. Um, but from a research perspective. And Kim Lawson Jenkins, who's sitting at the end and will be speaking last, will provide you with a more programmatic perspective. Kim's group, the cybersecurity branch, and my group, uh, which is in the um, Office of Research, work together very closely with respect to cybersecurity. Okay, so my group, which is part of RES, or the uh, Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, which provides technical advice, tools, and information for meeting NRC's mission. And this mission includes resolving safety and security issues, making regulatory decisions, and promulgating regulations and guidance. In fact, one of the driving forces behind our research is the development of novel technologies or novel implementation of existing technologies that are being considered for use in new and advanced reactors and also in operating reactors. In fact, in uh, my branch, uh, we have a small but crackerjack cyber team that is looking at these cybersecurity related challenges, gaps, and implications associated um, with the use of these technologies. So let's talk about some of the work we do. Ah, 
So if you've ever had the opportunity to hear Kim Lawson Jenkins speak, you might have heard her mention the um, inspector's toolbox, which is a metaphor for the cybersecurity inspector's capabilities. And I just love this analogy, so I steal it when, whenever I get the chance. Um, because in fact, what we in research are doing are, is developing the tools that are used in that toolbox. And some of those tools are, for instance, developing a technical basis for assessing certain aspects of the program, engaging actively in the revision and development of the necessary regulatory frameworks or infrastructures such as um, regulations and guidance documents, understanding the safety and cybersecurity issues associated with various technologies, um, and developing and maintaining the necessary core capabilities in uh, the various functional areas so that the cybersecurity inspectors have the expertise, knowledge, and experience to do their job efficiently and effectively. And this also includes the confirmatory and anticipatory research activities that we do in support of the known and future needs of the program office and regional offices. All right, so can anybody recall what that title was? You can like nod your head or shake your head. <laughs> All right. So the title, I, I made up the title and I still can't remember it, but it had something to do with shifting attack surfaces, uh, changing nuclear landscapes, and a research perspective. So right now I wanna uh, focus your attention on that shifting attack surface. Right? What is an attack surface and why is it shifting? So uh, when I presented my slides to my colleagues, they all said, you have to explain what an attack surface is. I was like, no, everybody knows what that is. But um, that was the feedback I got. So I do wanna say that um, a few years ago, there was a study done. Uh, several researchers examined like, like 600 something uh, uh, papers, journals that mentioned or had focused on uh, the concept of attack surface, and they found 49 different definitions of attack surface. So I only have 11 minutes left, so I'm not gonna go through all 49 definitions, but the, um, I will use the definition that is provided in the Regulatory Guide 5.71 Revision 1. An attack surface is the set of points on the boundary of a system, a system element, or an environment where an attacker can try to enter, cause an effect on, or extract data from that system, system environment, a system element, or environment. And that's a mouthful, but you know, the, the thing is, having a smaller attack surface from our perspective is better, unless you're a, a hacker, right? So why does it shift? Well, it shifts and expands because you have threats that keep evolving. You have new technologies that keep getting added into the system that bring their own set of risks and attack vectors. Um, and a, a shifting way of thinking about things. These are all things that um, shift that attack surface. For example, uh, malware. Malware is uh, becoming more sophisticated and targeted with increasing knowledge of industrial control systems and OT um, operational technology networks. And they possess greater physical, cyber physical attack capabilities. Uh, and not to mention they know how to lay low at, or they're becoming really good at laying low and uh, evading detection from uh, vulnerability scanners. So should we start thinking about maybe um, uh, the vulnerability management practices we have going on now? Uh, and then we also have uh, new and advanced reactors and sometimes operating reactors that propose to use various technologies like um, artificial intelligence, uh, wireless technologies, technologies that support remote, support remote operations. Uh, these new tech, so, um, you know, what kind of new attack vectors are these introducing? And on top of that, these new technologies don't really fit very neatly into the existing traditional physical security or other regulatory framework. At the NRC, Cybersecurity is, a, is, is an integral part of the uh, cyber, physical, cyber, uh, physical security program. But in fact, advanced reactors may require less, may rely less on physical security. And in that case, it, we may have to place more emphasis on the uh, cybersecurity aspect, right? So 
what should we focus our attention on? And these are just uh, some of the drivers that behind the research that we're working on, you know, to build the new tools for that toolbox, you know, I'm continuing with that metaphor. Um, all right, so these are some of the, a sampling of some of the research we've done uh, for the cybersecurity, to support the cybersecurity branch, the program offices, and the regional offices. Uh, for example, we are looking at the feasibility of using AI, uh, artificial intelligence, and machine learning in nuclear systems to be able to characterize uh, the cybersecurity states. Um, let's see. Nu the nuclear industry is very interested in expanding their use of wireless technologies in their environment. So uh, what we're doing is analyzing the impact that wireless, the use of wireless technologies would have. Um, specifically, we looked at mon um, using it for monitoring um, safety critical, safety related critical digital assets. Let's see. We are looking at um, developing knowledge and insights necessary for assessing the <clears throat> cybersecurity risks and concerns of remote, <clears throat> excuse me, remote monitoring and autonomous control technologies. And um, some of these ideas come from out of the blue. Today I was driving into work and I heard on the radio that the IIHS, it's the um, insurance industry for, oh, I forgot what it stands for. So, something about vehicle safety. Uh, but they are a US organization that uh, rates the safety of vehicles and vehicle technology. Um, and they examined, I think, 14 different, let me get the words correct, 14 different partially autonomous, automated driving systems and found little evidence that partial automation has any safety benefits because they introduce new risks into the system. And <clears throat> So uh, some interesting uh, things that they pointed out was there's, lack, there's a lack of adequate driver monitoring, you know, seeing if the driver is actually engaged uh, or are they playing with their cell phone and not looking up at you. And when they are looking at their cell phone, then you, uh, the a vehicle should give them you know, attention reminders, like wake up, pay attention, come on, wake up, right? Um, but, but that was a failure as well. And then they can also, because these uh, partially automated driving systems are not considered safety systems, they shouldn't be able to operate when the safety, vital safety features are not in place. But um, that was not the case. Uh, they could work even when the person was not wearing a seatbelt or when other safety features were turned off as well. Anyway, so, oh, oh and uh, one last thing was that they should have had a human to, in the loop in the decision making process, but they did not. So um, there are interesting things, even in uh, autonomous driving, which is one of the more advanced autonomous technologies, there are lots, there's a lot of long way to go. And let's see, we are also examining the security issues and potential impact of using field programmable gate arrays in safety systems and also Zero trust framework. So if you've, you might have heard, zero trust is a somewhat bi big buzzword these days, and it's um, the, ag goes against the concept of the traditional perimeter-based defense, where with the perimeter-based defense, you're using firewalls and VPNs and saying, don't come in my door. Zero trust assumes the enemy is not at the door, it's already in the door in your system. What are you gonna do about it? So this is a project both Kim and I are we're actually working on together, and we want to find a way to apply it in an industrial control system environment, uh, develop suitable architectures and principles and frameworks that would work in there, and see what kind of controls would have to be used or adapted, um, and maybe propose it as an alternative for new and advanced reactors. Oh, and I ran out of space, so there, I, there were a couple of other research um, things I wanted to mention. We are, uh, is everybody familiar with EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute's technical assessment methodology, the TAM approach? Right. So um, it's an engineering approach, just in case you're not familiar with it, and basically they look at uh, how to see what you have, 
what your vulnerabilities are, how to mitigate those vulnerabilities it, to a level that is risk, uh, to, uh, to a certain level of acceptable risk. But the way it's done, it's, is, does, isn't, it doesn't really work well for cybersecurity inspections, which are based on the traditional met approach available in reg uh, regulatory guide 5.71 and NEI 0809. So we are looking at a methodology on how to assess uh, approaches, licensee approaches that use the TAM. And also, uh, one last thing I wanted to mention is that, if I can remember what it was, ah, developing a methodology for, for performing a cybersecurity audit alongside digital INC update safety reviews so that we can promote security by design. And as you can see, the research we do here is a mixture of providing a technical basis, understanding the issues, developing the tools, providing expertise, and performing that anticipatory and confirmatory research that I talked about a couple of slides earlier. And we obviously don't want to reinvent the wheel. So some parts of our research include looking at existing solutions in other industries. Um, and seeing if we can leverage the work and adapt it to our needs. For example, the wireless technology area, before we even did the work I mentioned earlier, we looked at other critical infrastructure industries and wondered if they had any use of wireless in their safety critical systems or environment and how they were protecting it. Um, so that was basically a sort of survey and interview. And spoiler alert, nobody. Let's see. So in conclusion, I just want to say that we work closely with the program office and regional offices to produce better tools for the inspector's toolbox that are timely and useful. And in addition, we coordinate and collaborate research and development activities with domestic and international stakeholders, national labs, universities, industry, and various federal organizations. And finally, since we have more research ideas than we have people, we prioritize the research according to how urgent the need is and how likely it is to be used, adapting the needs to the changing landscape and working to be ready for the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Anya. That was a really helpful introduction. So um, just, just to remind you, my name is Paul Shanes. I represent uh, the UK's Office for Nuclear Regulation. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a flavour of um, what we're doing in the UK on this topic, the way in which we go about regulating cybersecurity, and some of the approaches we're taking to um, enabling innovation within the sector, particularly with, a, with regards to new technology. So just a quick canter through the, the UK industry. Um, ONR is the UK's independent nuclear regulator. We regulate um, across a range of purposes within the UK civil nuclear sector, and we cover the entirety of the UK um, fuel cycle. So we cover the existing fleet of operating reactors, um, far fewer than, than here within the US, obviously, uh, the decommissioning estate, and then all of the provision of services and fuel cycle aspects that go with that, so service providers, the supply chain, et cetera, to varying degrees. And we operate across the traditional purposes of nuclear safety and nuclear security, but we also act as a single regulator covering uh, conventional or site health and safety, nuclear transport, and since our departure from Euratom, nuclear safeguards as well. So ONR operates as an outcome-focused regulator. Um, our approach uh, was recently changed within civil nuclear security to align with our already uh, relatively well-established safety regulatory approach. Um, the, the prime output of that being really the responsibility for demonstrating compliance and meeting regulatory outcomes rests firmly with the duty holder, the, the uh, regulated party. It wasn't always that way. So prior to 2017, we undertook a number of um, reviews in order to move from a more prescriptive approach to an outcome-focused approach. And as part of those reviews, um, we attempted to move away from such a draconian approach to, to mandating particular procedure standards and arrangements to our duty holders. And they were only partially successful 
because on each occasion when we did so, we gave a range of uh, model expectations, model um, methods that our duty holders could use to demonstrate regulatory compliance. And of course, like all good models, uh, when you provide a range of examples to those that you regulate, one of the easiest options is simply to follow them. So what we found was we were actually uh, encouraging uh, prescription through the back door. So in 2017, we moved to uh, a completely outcome-focused approach where we didn't give model standards and expectations, but rather provided advice to our inspectors on what good looks like and how to determine what constitutes good practice. The approach that we use is technology neutral and doesn't prescribe any particular outcomes, uh, any, sorry, rather, rather than outcomes, any particular uh, solutions. So from that perspective, we consider that we're relatively well placed to encourage innovation within the sector and also to ready ourselves for what the future might bring. But of course, nobody knows what the future might bring, so it's a, a challenge in itself. One thing that it does do uh, since 2017 is encourage a much more open and honest debate with those that we regulate. And uh, as has been mentioned a few times in this conference already, uh, those kind of pre-licensing, those early engagement conversations have proven really beneficial, particularly when our duty holders come forward with innovative solutions that we've not seen before. We're expected as a regulator to reduce the regulatory burden that we place on those that we regulate. Um, but fundamentally, in the same way as the NRC, we're here uh, for, uh, predominantly to protect society and ensure that we have a safe and secure industry, and that must take paramount um, primacy at all times. So I, I think within civil nuclear security within the UK, uh, there's a general acknowledgement that cybersecurity is not where it needs to be. Certainly when contrasted against more established uh, regulatory aspects, such as nuclear safety, that have had many years of experience in, in uh, regulatory attention. There's a uh, sector-wide cybersecurity strategy within the UK, which was developed in conjunction with government and industry. And both within that document, which is publicly available on the UK government website, and in our own uh, Chief Nuclear Inspector's annual report, both of those um, publications, again, publicly available on our website, uh, recognize that our duty holders have more to do in this space. What the infographic on, this, on the screen there is showing is the areas that we as a regulator have found ourselves focusing on over the last few years as we've increased our own competence and capability in the field of cybersecurity. And interestingly, many of the aspects that you'll see highlighted there are not the more technical side of cybersecurity. So yes, we can look at whether or not systems are appropriately patched, whether or not firewalls are in place, rule sets are, are as you might expect. But actually, time and time again, as we do kind of root cause analysis, what we're finding is that it's the more strategic aspects of cybersecurity that are wanting. So uh, areas such as governance, risk management, some of those basic attributes that you would expect to see in a highly mature and well-established industry may well be in place for other areas that we regulate, but have been found to be lacking in the field of cybersecurity. So we set out over the last 12 months or so, three areas of regulatory priority to improve the uh, standard of cybersecurity across the sector. And these align to that sector-wide strategy that I mentioned a moment ago, and support a thematic priority across the industry to improve this area. The first of those areas um, focuses on government or governance arrangements within um, the leadership and the resultant culture that's applied to cybersecurity across the sector. We've rolled out recently a targeted campaign of board level engagements to really drive home the message to those that we regulate that cybersecurity needs to be governed and led in the same way as other areas of the regulated aspects of the industry. I apologize for the state of the slides. They don't seem to have translated very well, so I'll, I'll try and read out the bits that are missing. The second area focuses on risk management and cyber protection capabilities at our most critical sites. So what we're looking at here is particularly where there's interfaces, and there's a growing number of them, between traditional IT and OT um, systems. And this sets out to ensure that claims that are made by those that we regulate, that there can be no potential uh, cybersecurity event that could lead to an unacceptable radiological consequence, can be evidenced appropriately to us as a regulator. 
there are lots of declarations made by those that we regulate to that effect, but we're seeking greater evidence, particularly as, uh, as Anya has said, you know, that, that attack surface increases and we find that convergence increases across the OT and the IT estates. And then the third area, which again, apologize, you can't see there, um, focuses upon intelligent-led um, independent assurance activities. So what do we mean by that? Well, clarifying expectations that as part of evidencing arrangements from those that we regulate, um, there are independent assessments conducted so as to avoid us as the regulator getting too tactical. So I mentioned earlier, we can go and look at firewall rule sets, we can look at systems and their, their hardening. What we found was over the last few years, as we did that, we would attend a, a duty holder organization, we'd lift a stone, we'd find a problem, we'd raise a regulatory issue, the regulatory issue would be managed, resolved appropriately, closed out, and then we'd return after a period of time, we'd lift another stone, and lo and behold, we find the same problem again in a different area. And it really comes back to that um, first priority around effective governance and leadership for cybersecurity. We we're really focusing on the root cause issues and raising the bar such that the duty holders that we regulate are taking ownership and responsibility themselves rather than relying on the regulator effectively to act, uh, to act as one of their own assurance arms. So we've placed far greater onus on those that we regulate to go out and get independent assurance undertaken that we are cited on from a scoping perspective and then can contribute towards the claims, arguments and evidence put forward as part of that outcome focused regime. A really busy slide that I don't expect people to be able to necessarily digest in, in one go, but I was asked to, to highlight some of the areas that we're looking at and are potentially concerned about from a cybersecurity perspective. And I don't think anyone in the room will be surprised to see some of the things listed on, on the left-hand side here. Um, I don't think it's our sector alone that are grappling with these issues. I don't think um, that it's the UK alone that are, are, are grappling with them either. So as you might expect, you know, we're interested in artificial intelligence, we're interested in the increasing use of robotics across the estate, and some of the more traditional aspects that we've seen developing over the last few years. So you know, a, an ever increasing and complex supply chain, ensuring appropriate quality assurance of uh, critical digital assets, components, et cetera high-risk vendors and certain nations providing certain technologies might be of interest. So there's a whole range of things that we're looking at there that present a whole range of challenges. Now, I mentioned earlier on that from an outcome-focused perspective, we consider ourselves pretty well able to receive um, and to consider a whole range of new technologies and innovative solutions within the sector. The way in which we deal with such proposals is to look at what constitutes good practice. And in our outcome-focused regime, what we do is we look at different tiers of what we consider to be good practice. At the highest level, we might have legislative um, expectations set out within UK legislation. One step down from that, but still of great importance, might be established standards from professional bodies, from uh, international organizations, the likes of, you know, um, IEC 62443, for example, in the OT space, or NIST, for example, we don't uh, solution here, we don't offer those as sole solutions to any particular problem, but they are the sort of things that we will benchmark against when we receive proposals. And then below that, we have interpretive standards whereby there's a lack of a particular consensus in an area because something is new and emerging, and the industry may come together itself in order to put forward proposals on how best to tackle an area. We found that certainly when there was an initial uptake of um, deployments of solutions to the cloud prior to our own um, uh, technical authorities providing guidance in that area. So there's a range of RGP, relevant good practice, that we can, we can call upon for many areas, but the challenge comes with the emerging technology where there is a lack of that RGP. How does one then go about determining what good looks like and whether or not something is sensible? And it's those independent confidence building measures that we're seeking to determine whether or not something is appropriate. Now under our regulatory approach, a lot of the onus does face, uh, does, does rely upon the, uh, the part of the, the duty holder or the licensee. 
and it can be really challenging for them to evidence to our satisfaction that something is appropriate. But we are open to that conversation. The biggest challenge with all of this that we're finding is balancing all of these desires, these novel approaches against kind of standing still in many respects. So many of our duty holders have already admitted they need to do more work in this space. Many of them need to address the basics, as we saw in that early slide. The challenge is finding the resources, the skilled, capable individuals to do that at the same time as addressing some of these perhaps higher profile areas. We tend to find across a lot of the estate, there's a lot of interest in deploying robotics to reduce um, safety risk, for example, in high hazard areas. A lot of investment in that and a lot of keenness for cybersecurity practitioners to support that area. Far less interest in finding people that are willing to address cybersecurity challenges of obsolete technology, um, items that are perhaps of less uh, interest externally, you know, when one might seek a future job. So it's a real balance for our duty holders to try and focus not only on what the future looks like, but actually steadying the ship in terms of what they already have at the moment. And that's really where we're trying to get them to focus in many areas alongside some of these new areas. So one of the ways in which we've been trying to tackle the problem of a lack of relevant good practice is through something called regulatory sandboxing. Um, quite a grand title really for, for not a particularly grand solution. All it effectively is is an opportunity to come together with those that we regulate in a safe and open space where there's very little judgment and to effectively workshop, to war game different scenarios, to talk about potential solutions to problems and for ONR to act less as a regulator but more in an advice and guidance capacity. One of our remits from government is to act as that early advice and guidance sounding board, not to solution here, not to determine the outcome um, up front or to drive the solution, but to provide that upfront confidence in the sort of expectations we might have. And our sandboxing approach is exactly intended to do that. So we've done that um, a couple of times now. One of the areas we focused on initially was artificial intelligence, and we looked at a few use cases set out perhaps what the problem was that was seeking to be addressed and looked at what mock um, example claims arguments evidence might be in place um, from a security and a safety perspective in order to satisfy later regulatory decisions. Again, this is all publicly available. We've published a report on our findings on our website. Very happy for people to have a look at it and do come back to us. We work alongside not only those that we regulate, but academia and government as well in this space. One of the main learning points from us was that by following this approach, we can focus in on a particular use case, a particular scenario, because it's very easy, looking back a couple of slides at that big long list that I put up, to um, be overwhelmed by the potential of new technology and the new developments that are coming without actually considering what the practical application of that might be. And quite simply, ONR doesn't have the resource to go and invest in lots of things that may never come to fruition. So we have to focus our resource appropriately, and this has been one of those uh, opportunities to do so. So things that we've learned along the way as we've been through the journey, our outcome-focused approach, as I mentioned, I think puts us in a really good position to encourage innovation and to um, be really open to ideas. Um, but it has been a radical change for the sector, moving away from a very prescriptive approach previously to one where duty holders need to upskill and to determine things for themselves and have a very different relationship with us as the regulator. It's not only been a big learning point for them, but it's been a massive learning curve for us as well because our regulatory approach has had to change. We've moved away from being more of an audit type function um, to providing upfront advice and guidance and ensuring that we can determine um, the appropriateness of solutions that are put forward based upon concrete evidence. And that's required a huge upskilling on the part of the inspectors as well. All of that though, I think, does put us in good position when it comes to new and innovative technologies. Um, I'm not saying that we have the answers to any of the things on that list, but hopefully the approach that we have allows us to work collaboratively with those that we regulate and external third parties in order to try and identify how we could best use those technologies within a regulated environment. And I think I'll probably take questions at the end. So thank you for your attention.
right, good afternoon. So my name is Rich Magabro from the Nuclear Energy Institute. And I'm gonna go through the, the history and then future of the nuclear cybersecurity program. So when I was asked to go through this, um, Jeff did ask if I could go through the, the history. So we're gonna go way back in time. All right, so if you look at this, right, you're looking at a technological advance at some point, right, in its simplest form. And, at what, and what happened, right? There's somebody there spying from behind a tree. They're likely stealing it, reproducing it, um, possibly copying it, and then improving upon it, or even trying to figure out how they could steal it and use it maliciously um, for, some, for some other way, right? But as you look at that and go into the future to today, right, we've evolved, but also so has the adversary. So here you're seeing same scenario, right? Instead of hiding behind a tree, you have somebody hiding behind a script, right? Somebody's looking at a computer, maybe coming up with something innovative, uh, similar to somebody who's just created fire. But now this hacker or a person who wants to steal this information, right, they continue to use the original playbook, but now it's through, uh, through electronic means, right? Which means the process by which we defend against the adversary has to advance as well. Right, so where did it all start <clears throat> in our side in the nuclear industry? As an industry, we had to decide what to protect, and there was a lot to consider, right? What was the adversary thinking? What was the target? Was the target theft of information, denial of service, sabotage, grid disturbance in your, in your dark clouds up there that you're looking at, right? And if you're thinking, what's that middle building? That's a nuke plant because it's a plant, right? So. Um, so depending on the adversary's objectives, be it theft of information, acts of cyber terrorism, designed to result in mass casualties, the types of computer systems he has to target will have to change, right? So the concept is subtle, but the nature of the assets targeted plays a significant role in how we protect them. One measure in which we protect them at the nuclear plants is to disconnect them from our external network. So if you look at the picture, Business assets are outside of the nuclear plant, right? So they're not protected in the same way. But it's also important to say that the concept of cyber is a very simple reality, right? Cyber is very easy to get wrong and very hard to get right, right? Because it's a constantly changing landscape. And protecting the wrong assets will result in failure on our end, right? So we have to know what to protect. And we can't protect everything because at that point, you're not protecting anything. So we have to be very specific on what we're doing. So you see there's some overlap out there between federal organizations, between FERC and the NRC, in those interests at the power plants. You see generation transmission, those are balance of plant areas, right? So nuclear power plants, they generate the electricity. So FERC, they have an interest in that, right? But they also use uranium, so the NRC cares about that. So <clears throat> differing in those areas, Right, we were able to find that the NRC, as a single regulator in that determination between both FERC and the NRC agreeing on that, we wound up with a single regulator similar to what Paul was talking about. Right? But just like other federal agencies, they differ in their oversight of functions of power generation, transmission, bulk electric systems. So nuclear, and then in the nuclear side, nuclear and enterprise programs also differ in their requirements, but the focus is always the same. Detect, delay, respond to, and recover from cyber attacks. That has to be the focus. But cyber security on the enterprise side, on the business asset side, is much different than cyber security on the operational side of the house. But having that division and determining that division of protection was the start at which the nuclear cybersecurity program began. So we had to decide who owns what and what exactly did we need to protect. So similar to Paul's slide that he went through the timeline, this is our timeline, right? And when we look back over the years, it shows that very early on, the industry recognized that there was a threat and it's been an evolving threat and that we have been, as an industry, very nimble and able to continue evolving over time, defending against that threat. And as you, as you can see on here, the cybersecurity program has essentially been around since the early 2000s. We developed our cybersecurity task force in that time frame, 
NEI 404, which is the original uh, predecessor to the cybersecurity program for power reactors. Cyber attack was added to the design basis threat. And then NRC endorsed NEI 0809 cybersecurity plan, which is the associated document to, NEI, uh, to uh, the NRC Reg Guide 571. In the next series of years, all cybersecurity programs have been approved. And then plants fully implemented the program, and all sites have been inspected to that program. And currently, the NRC has implemented the updated NRC cybersecurity program uh, inspection procedure and is now taking a look at maybe there's an evolution to that as well. I forgot there was movement on this. All right. So next slide. <clears throat> so when we look at our cybersecurity performance objectives, we have to recognize that here's a key, here's a series of key attributes to the cybersecurity program. The cybersecurity program is an integrated component of the physical security program. And that makes sense after all because it is a design basis threat rule. As part of the physical security protection program, the cybersecurity program's principal focus is that of preventing against radiological sabotage, just like in the second box. Finally, when we look at it, the cybersecurity program is not static. It's not a once and done uh, program. The program is designed to evolve over time, ensure that it continues to be effective and evolves at defending against an evolving threat landscape. And I think we've, I think each of us has said evolving threat landscape at least once on this panel. And that's a very important element. While, while the plants have programs in place for protecting sensitive information, like safeguards information and personal information, the NRC's cybersecurity requirements are about protecting against any malicious act, including a cyber attack that could endanger the health and safety of the public by exposure to radiation. So where are we going from here? And I use the DeLorean because we're going back to the future. All right, 88 miles an hour. So we're looking at continuous improvement of the current reactor fleet, right? We're updating our cybersecurity plan, that NEI 0809 document. The NRC is taking a look at their inspector guidance and updating guidance in there, an appendix echo to NEI, or uh, appendix echo to 0609, and which provides additional uh, examples to minor or more than minor. We're taking a look at the industry uh, OE through a cybersecurity inspection information forum. We have cybersecurity conferences and training forums where we're looking at opportunities to improve that training as cybersecurity evolves over time. How do we need to implement our programs a little bit better? How do we stay sharp on implementing our programs better in the industry? And we're looking at ways and opportunities to incorporate the principles of the very low safety significance issue resolution of the VLIS or process. And even beyond that, when we look forward to that, what do we need, right? So we're looking at advanced cyber. We're looking at advanced reactors. And the US, like it says, is embarked on an unprecedented effort to decarbonize the electrical sector and broader economy. And there could be many NRC applications going in in the next few years. And part 53 that we've heard many times throughout this forum is the NRC's opportunity to enable that safe, reliable, advanced nuclear, right? So what do we need? as an industry to implement, right? As we await new rules and associated regulatory guides, we need to ensure that what's on the screen is in place for the next generation of power generators and nuclear power. We need a regulatory framework that's used and that is useful, that it's risk informed, technology inclusive and performance based. Safety is assured without unnecessary regulatory burden, that it's efficient and timely with our licensing approvals. I think we've heard that a few times in, in this, uh, forum as well, greater licensing flexibility in how we implement those programs, as well as long-term regulatory stability. So in closing, if you look at all these empty boxes, no matter what we fill in each of these boxes, whether it be some kind of futuristic technology like quantum cryptography way down the road, or artificial intelligence, or generic, a generic adversary, new vulnerabilities, you name it, right? We need to work together in our industry to defend and keep our critical infrastructure safe and secure for years to come. 
And with that, I want to thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it over to Kim. Okay, good evening. <laughs> I'm going to be speaking for briefly on cybersecurity oversight in the changing nuclear security landscape. The cloud on the left of this uh, slide represents aspects of a cybersecurity landscape where the US NRC cybersecurity regulations for nuclear power plants and the associated regulatory guidance were issued in 2009-2010. Security for digital assets and computer systems heavily leveraged areas of operational nuclear power plants, such as actions taken for software reliability, um, physical security, and operation, operator experience and training. Licensees credited actions for software reliability for safety-related functions. Cybersecurity plans heavily leveraged physical security protections as well as operator experience and training. The regulatory guidance that the NRC generated did heavily rely on prescriptive measures such as implementation of specific security controls. However, I will note that even in the original version of the guidance, the guidance allowed for risk-informed treatments or, or measures where the level of protection was based on the importance of the safety or security function. All the things on the left are still there, but the cloud on the right represents the landscape in the fast approaching future. Artificial intelligence, drones, remote operations and maintenance, industrial internet of things, these are technologies that will be introduced to improve safety, security, and operational efficiencies. However, from a cybersecurity perspective, the new te technologies will also change the attack surface and can introduce new threats, attack pathways, and vulnerabilities. This slide represents a holistic view of security at a nuclear power plant that consists of physical security, cybersecurity, operational security, and information security. In each security type, if you look at the top, you will see a notation uh, in the figure representing how much of a, that security type contributes to the overall security posture of a nuclear power plant. And I just use notations, but W plus X plus Y plus Z equals 100%. But we don't say what percentage it is. That's going to be very site specific based on the, on the plant. As mentioned in the, previous in the previous slide, today's features implemented in physical security and cyber, sorry, physical security and operational security. That's where a lot of the security focus is. However, if you think about that, physical security and operational security is where industry is looking to gain some efficiencies also. So as you make changes to those things, it's going to impact certain other areas of security. A reduction in physical security will likely increase the need for cybersecurity protection. With remote monitoring and access, information previously restricted to the boundaries or the physical perimeters of the plant uh, will require, with, with remote access or monitoring, will require additional information security protections. New technologies such as, um, new use of technology such as automation and artificial intelligence will impact operational security. In addition to training the human, which we've done for operational security, models will now have to be trained with data to implement the technology securely and effectively. Okay. 
So we've mentioned throughout the presentation risk-informed security. Risk-informed security must be evidence-based. A risk analysis should be performed prior, hopefully prior, to obtaining and installing technology. Uh, the ability to perform monitoring and detection is crucial. The plant operator must know what a normal event, expected normal events, let me say that one more time, what are expected normal events and what are abnormal events. Okay. Automation and artificial intelligence processes can take actions without communication okay, that would normally be monitored. And, uh, and obviously this is gonna make a difference in the protective strategy that's used. Monitoring and detection is also important based on that risk analysis that I spoke of for, at first. Um, with the risk analysis, we're assuming, if you assume it's perfect, you'll know everything in advance. But we don't work in a, we don't operate in a world like that. The risk analysis will not be perfect. So therefore, you need monitoring and detection to catch those cases that were not anticipated. Okay. And with technology changing, it would be wonderful if the technology will self-report if it's in a secure state or not. So you know when you start using it, it is in a secure state. So this is something that a vendor will help to work with the operators to, to get that kind of information, to understand if the technology is in a secure state. Oh, let me go back. I'm going to mention something on that previous slide since I, do I have a reverse button here? Yeah, the one below. I do that. Yeah. This, I, I'm going to go quickly over this because licensees, knowing what you have, Rich, other people have spoken about that. That's critical. We have protections in place already for supply chain, asset management, configuration management. Those are critical. This is very important. Um, you can't protect what you really don't know. And the attacker, you don't want, we don't want to be in a position where the attacker will know more about the assets mm -hmm. and the vulnerabilities and how to exploit them than we do. Cybersecurity risk analysis. It's, as I said, it's important to understand the plant functions affected by the technology. It's important to understand the minimal capabilities of the technology that should be used to support those identified plant functions. And it's important to evaluate the risk, the new attack surfaces and vulnerabilities, and the mitigations. The licensees or applicants' motives for using a technology will likely be different than the motivation of the attacker. Okay. The attacker will misuse the technology to accomplish their goals. The outcome of uh, cybersecurity risk analysis is that the licensee should understand what it will take to securely deploy the technology and operate it and this evidence will be, can be provided to the regulators. This is um, a diagram that I generated to show the process that we believe that when technology is introduced to a, a plant that the you should, there should be an evaluation of the new risk associated with the technology. If the decision is going forward to, to have that technology in the plant, to de determine what cybersecurity procedures and processes need to be updated. Okay. The licensee will go on and implement those security controls based on the risk analysis, and those controls should be monitored. So this is the circle. And then as you monitor the controls, you may decide, find new risks, as I mentioned earlier. You adjust and you go forward. So it's a circular argument, a circular system here. A fair amount of the work 
will take place in evaluating the new risk. A lot of work will take place there. How will security controls to address risks be implemented? Security requirements associated with technical security controls should be given to vendors based on the risk assessment and evaluation. So I'll give a, a brief example. Okay. Um, autonomous operation or monitoring. Okay, if you have autonomous operations, there will probably be less communication to monitor at that point. So you have to monitor the actual processes and actions that are being performed on a device. How is this implemented in step, the first step and second step of this diagram? Those are the kind of questions and things that need to be discussed before purchasing the new tech and installing the new technology. Um, Anya has already mentioned tool, the toolbox analogy. For cybersecurity plans, they contain cybersecurity controls that are implemented. And there's always been a debate over the last 10 years, how many cybersecurity controls do we really need, which are really effective. And the analogy I use with the toolbox is to look at your own home. You have a toolbox. Do you use every tool in that toolbox? Probably not. <laughs> Some you may never use. But they are there because you don't know what's coming in the future. You know some things you'll use quite often, other things you may not. But if you don't want to always have to get new controls in there, it's probably best to understand the purpose of the controls and have them in the toolbox, okay? For the operational security, for the managerial or administrative controls, or for the technical security controls. By having all those controls, you will have defense in depth to be able to detect, respond to, and recover from a cyber attack. I wanted, I and there was another point I wanted to make about all the security controls. Oh, when we had a prescriptive way of operating and inspecting, it made sense. I under, there's an understanding why you would not want to have 140 security controls. You don't want to have to inspect to those. However, okay, when you're doing it based on risk analysis, okay, there's no advantage or less advantages to having a number of controls in your toolbox. So that's why I'm saying I think everyone should reconsider just understanding the purpose of the control and having it available to use if necessary. Um, I've spoken about what the regulator and vendors and everybody else is doing. We have work to do at the cyber, at, um, in the cybersecurity branch at the NRC, okay? We have been adapting based on lessons learned from inspections during COVID about focusing on the most important things when we're on site and trying to get information uh, before we get to the site to have the most effective oversight possible during the inspection. And that oversight includes licensee self-assessments for us to see the evidence that how, how they consider that their cybersecurity plans are working. Um, we have been participating in pre-application and licensing meetings with NRR, the Office of Nuclear Regulation staff, um, so that we can understand the importance of the safety features that are being in, these, in, the, new, um, in the new plants. And then we can focus on what's important for the Messiah Defense Security aspect. Mm -hmm. As Anya said, that um, my office, my group works very closely with Office of Research on issues involving novel, and novel use of technologies at nuclear facility plants. And we're also in the process of updating and generating new NRC guidance associated with cybersecurity. Okay. So, in summary, the use of emerging technology can improve plant security, plant safety, plant security, and operating efficiencies. Risk assessments are needed to perform securely deployed, to, to clear, sorry, securely deployed the technology within the plant. 
No one will know nuclear facilities as well as the people in this audience and people probably watching this presentation. All of us will be involved in developing, deploying, operating, and providing oversight for these new technologies. There is a need for all of us to communicate with each other and to provide, in order to provide adequate security, risk assessments, and oversight. Okay. And the last bullet is that um, as we're, my group is working in, in answer with the Office of Research and also in the Office of um, Nuclear, Regulator, Nuclear Reactor Regulations for safety, to identify safety functions and to um, deploy cybersecurity programs um, at the plants to make sure that the oversight is effective. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, can we get the QR code up on the screen in case anybody missed it in the first round? Uh, so wants to ask questions. Uh, we have had a couple of questions that have come in. Um, I will sort through them and, and ask as they, as I have them here. But uh, Paul, first question for, for you. So a member of the audience indicated that they found the UK's approach to cybersecurity uh, very interesting and, and that the NRC should consider adopting a similar, or a similar focused um, approach. The question was that inspectors, and I'll, I'll paraphrase a little bit here as well, is that licensees as well tend to appreciate having clear thresholds or clear guidance on how to implement various cybersecurity requirements or very, various other regulatory requirements. Um, how well have the inspectors and the uh, duty holders and um, adapted to the, to the new paradigm and how well do they, or how well have they determined what compliance or how well do they determine compliance or how well does, is compliance assessed uh, from both the licensee aspect or the duty holder aspect and the inspector aspect? Okay. Um, so I think it's been a mixed bag if we're being completely honest. Um, I will start by saying that I think that our transition to outcome-focused regulation for security has been, on the whole, a huge improvement to where we were before. On the basis of sheer compliance with mandates issued by ONR and our colleagues in government. So I do think that we have seen um, a positive improvement in that respect. But in terms of how well has the industry, I guess, coped with the change, and then also ONR, I think if that's your question, um, it, it's definitely been mixed. So there are some of our duty holders that have relished the opportunity to have um, greater uh, involvement and um, suggestions in terms of how they will deliver the outcomes that we set. And that's very much how we have approached things. We have set high level outcomes, high level objectives for what we want to see. And the way in which the duty holder community does that is really for them to decide. We have a really diverse industry in the UK. So we have you know, operating facilities that operate obviously under a commercial model, but we also have a, a huge part of the estate um, in government ownership and control through its decommissioning phase. And, you know, no two aspects of the, of the industry really are alike. And so it has been really positive in that respect. But in terms of the actual duty holder approach, it has certainly been mixed. Some duty holders, I think, have uh, preferred a more prescriptive approach because, to be quite frank, it's easier to go into a boardroom and say, ONR says we need this, I need this much money, I need this many people to achieve it. If it's not quite that clear, it can be really difficult for that conversation to happen at the boardroom. Well, how have you determined that you need this many people, this much funding, etc.? So where we've seen the biggest challenge, I think, has been in the small to medium enterprise community, um, certainly across aspects of the supply chain, where we take 
a, a slightly different approach. We, we're not prescriptive, but what we do is we risk profile and we suggest controls that would meet the threshold um, for those organizations that, you know, the person in charge of security is also in charge of half a dozen other things. So we've tried to be proportionate in the approach to our move to outcome-focused regulation, um, but certainly some duty holders have been in favor of it far more than others. In terms of ONR's um, approach, it has required a, a, a kind of paradigmatic shift really in terms of the inspector's mindset. Again, some of the inspectors have, have struggled with that transition because they've been very used to, to sort of following uh, a more compliance-led approach. Um, what we now do is we issue guidance to our inspectors in order for them to be able to reach consistent regulatory judgments in a way that's proportionate and targeted. And that has helped dramatically, but it, it has required a change in approach for, for both our staff and those that we regulate. And, um, you know, it's not complete. We're not fully there yet. We have further to go. And, uh, you know, without naming and shaming, certain parts of the industry have found it easier than others. Does that kind of cover? Yeah. It was quite a long question, so I hope <laughs> I've covered most of it. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I think it does. Uh, next question is for Anya. The, could you provide some detail on the research that's, research that's being conducted on the field, program, field programmable gate arrays in INC safety systems? Sure. So industry is interested and is using field programmable gate arrays in safety systems and some of the claims they have made is that, oh, there's no software, so there's no vulnerabilities, or there's no attack surface. And instead of just taking that at face value, we are, we have examined um, some, the literature and, and uh, looked at what kind of vulnerabilities are, because FPGAs aren't vulnerability free. And really it depends on the type of FPGA, how it's used, um, things like that. Uh, um, and these days, there's not just a regular, just, just simple FPGA, there's a um, you know, system on a chip. So now when, when the claim that there was no software, there's no software. Uh, let's see, so we sort of started out with looking at some of the vulnerabilities that were on FPGAs or related to FPGAs, and then we provided very high level guidance on when you're reviewing something with FPGAs, what should you be looking for? You know, what, what type of FPGA is this? Is this um, there's like something called SRAM, um, uh, uh, anti-fuse, and other kinds of FPGAs that have different characteristics. Um, and let's see, I think EPRI even had some guidance on one type is better than another uh, from a, a security perspective. And uh, uh, we also, Based on that, those metrics, we sort of provided you know, things that the inspector could sort of check out. And it's just a high-level framework that we created um, to sort of understand better the actual security issues associated with FPGAs instead of just taking it for granted that um, they are m much more secure than, for instance, microprocessor-based systems. Thank you. Um, this question was directed to NRC staff, but I'm gonna actually pivot and ask uh, Rich and Paul also to address this question. Um, given the competitive nature of talent needed to assess and inspect the status of cybersecurity in US nuclear fleet, what is the NRC doing to attract, retain, and train cybersecurity inspectors to ensure quality and consistency? But not inspectors, but the own, your own talent that you would need for, for implementing the system for Rich and uh, obviously Paul for security, or for inspection. but. Uh, essentially, the, the, this is a very difficult question to answer um, in the sense that the leading thing that the NRC is doing to identify the talent that we need or to identify um, where we need additional talent is, is through our own uh, workforce planning program where we identify what areas we, or what skills we have within the agency and what we need to either develop our own internal, our own internal staff to give them the training, identify external training resources, or, or identify if we need to develop internal training. Um, and then to use that to 
either recruit uh, new personnel directly out of school, experienced personnel that are, or experienced uh, people that, that are already out in the field and able to, that have the skill sets that we were looking for. Um, we, we have a lot of different areas within the workforce planning, or within our workforce planning where we identify what we need um, and, and fill those gaps. Um, I know the, the staff within the cybersecurity branch go or have a lot of uh, training internal and external to develop their skills and enhance their skills. Uh, research programs or the research groups have the same uh, opportunities for, the, for training. Um, but we're also hiring new and experienced personnel or new, new personnel and experienced personnel in order to um, fill out those skill sets even more so or, or provide uh, additional um, I'll say margin within our own workforces so that we have those skills going forward. Um, Richard Paul, if you want to. I can go first. That's fine. So I can give a perspective from the industry at least. Um, you know, similar to what Jeff said, site, uh, site workforce planning is where it begins, right? Identifying that pipeline for, for quality personnel to take over those roles within the cybersecurity program. As, you've, as you saw on my slide, this has been going, you know, the cyber program has been in place for quite a many years. So the folks who stood up that program are likely either moving into a next, next generation of pro programs of ownership, right? They may become managers, they may become higher level leaders, leaving that onto the next team to provide care and feeding of those programs. And so as they look forward, what's that succession planning look like for knowledge transfer and retention, right? So sites are beginning to develop that. At NEI, we're taking a look at that holistically. We're starting to see during inspections what seems to be um, issues of concern maybe when, we're, when um, findings are identified. What's it associated with? Is it more associated with um, training, is it resources, uh, staffing, is there documentation challenges? So th these are some of the things where we're starting to trend and identify to where we could provide that feedback back to the industry that maybe, you know, uh, do we have to start looking at um, additional training throughout the year, right? As folks stood up the program, they were very close to the development of it, the pedigree of the program, but as that knowledge transfer turns over throughout the years, how is that being retained, right? If you're hiring someone brand new in that had maybe new to nuclear, then they're gonna have to start at the beginning, right? And that's one of the ways, one of the main reasons we took a look at the NEI 0809 guidance, right? That guidance is a big document in itself, but the guidance over time had additional pieces of guidance that were not in that document, but they were approved ways to implement the program that the NRC said these, these essentially meet the intent of the regulation. So as a program manager, you would take your NEI guidance document and then you'd have to go look for four, five, six other documents as well as frequently asked questions and answers to that. So we decided let's put it all in one spot where even somebody new to nuclear coming into the cyber program could pick up one document and find everything they need to know for implementing the guidance. So that was one way in which NEI sort of tried to play a role in knowledge uh, transfer, but also the fluid turnover of that knowledge transfer. But looking back at the sites, I think identifying a pipeline and need for uh, new personnel is something that the industry is looking at, Jeff. And I'll turn it over to Paul. So I think there's, there's a lot to say on this topic, and um, it's kind of where to start. I, there's a huge challenge here. So when we recruit inspectors within ONR, within cybersecurity, we're looking for people that understand cybersecurity and have a passion for it, but people that are accepting of the fact they will no longer be hands-on with cybersecurity. And that's a challenge in itself. Then we need people that are comfortable with or able to develop skills around regulation and enabling approach. Uh, able to engage with people, encourage change, do all the good things that you would hope to see in an effective regulator. Then we typically slap on a government security clearance on top of that. And then we tell them they've got to work in typically one of three locations and possibly support sites that are in some 
challenging areas within the UK to get to. So when you start piling those requirements onto a job advert, as we've discovered, your pool of candidates reduces significantly with every one of those aspects. So not only is it a challenge for us to recruit people, it's a challenge for us to retain them, and it's equally a challenge to recruit and retain individuals that don't all look, sound, and act the same because we believe that a diverse workforce would be a more healthy workforce. So none of those are solutions, I appreciate that, but those are the challenges that we as a regulator face, and I'm sure that's true of other disciplines as well, but my particular area of concern is obviously cybersecurity. So some of the things that we've been trying to do to address that, we've been working really closely with a, a new professional body which has been uh, recently given a royal charter within the UK called the UK Cybersecurity Council. So for the first time, cybersecurity has a dedicated professional body within the UK which is seeking to professionalise that part of the community. So cybersecurity professionals across all walks of life, all sectors, and that's not been there before. And the aspiration of that body, and, and I don't represent them, but, but in a nutshell, what I believe is that they are seeking to professionalize cybersecurity in a way that would be akin to any other formally recognized professional group. And that, I think, is really important because what that does is it acknowledges the status of cybersecurity as a valid profession. And that, coupled with wider UK um, aspects around training and education for cybersecurity are having a hugely positive effect, I think, in, in the future talent pipeline. Because, you know, when I went through, uh, there, were, there were no cybersecurity degrees. In fact, cybersecurity was a bit of a, 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 a jovial term. It wasn't really recognized as a, as a proper profession and uh, people didn't really believe it, it existed. So all of that is going on in the background beyond ONR's direct control, but we're contributing to a lot of the discussions and we're supporting the new uh, council on cybersecurity actively to try and promote and, and to ensure that we can um, have our views represented. Closer to home, what we do is, um, because it's so difficult to recruit people in cybersecurity, we operate something called a specialist generalist model. So we expect our cybersecurity inspectors to have a general appreciation and understanding of cybersecurity across the piece. But what we then do is we expect them to focus in on one or two niche areas within the domains of cybersecurity because it's a very broad field. So you know, no two people are alike and it's really difficult to find people with those same skills. And actually, I don't want a dozen people that are cloud security experts or a dozen people that are specialists in OT because we regulate far more broadly than that. So I need a diverse mix of individuals. And if I'm not careful, when I recruit people, what they do is they all kind of want to do the same type of training courses, many of them actually around the topics that I raised in my, in my slides there around the new emerging tech, because that's the area of interest, that's what everyone's interested in. Trying to get people qualified in obsolete technology is a challenge, because a lot of people aren't really interested in it. So that's another thing that we've been focusing on. And then more widely within the UK, uh, there's been the creation recently, and I think it, it, it will really come into its own uh, 1st of April, of a new nuclear uh, task force which is focused on careers more generally within the, the, the nuclear industry within the UK, given its resurgence, given uh, SMRs, advanced technologies, uh, potential for new power plants, etc. Because there's a recognition, not only for cyber security, but across many of the uh, domains of uh, ensuring a, a healthy industry, we're all gonna be kind of fishing from the same pool. And if we're not careful, we're just kind of poaching each other's staff all the time. So those are some of the things that we're working on, but it is a real challenge. You know, ONR for cybersecurity inspectors has an always on recruitment campaign. There's no end date at the moment. And I, don't, I can't see there being an end date because I, I simply struggle to bring in the caliber of individuals that we need. Um, but we are recruiting at all levels from graduate through to experienced inspector um, and it is a challenge and you know we offer I believe re relatively good terms and, and remuneration for the roles um, and it is still a challenge because ultimately cybersecurity is traversing every sector and so you know not only are we competing with perhaps say defense and other aspects of critical national infrastructure we're, we're competing with every sector for these individuals 
And as I come back to my earlier point, many cybersecurity individuals like to be hands-on. And that is not something that I can offer them. And that's a real challenge. So it takes a particular kind of person to come and work for OR, and And that's, that's hard. Thank you. Uh, next question I have is for Kim. Um, what are some of the unique aspects of performing inspections for cybersecurity programs that we don't see with other safety security inspections? And how are these managed? I'm, I'm thinking of just the, uh, the inspections for more like physical security and, and in, in scenarios where in a hard science, like physics or chemistry, where the, the basics are there. You know what the parameters are. You know what's something safe and reliable from the hard sciences. But with something like cybersecurity, it's more like, I would think, like biology, or things that you don't, you know, they can evolve and change. And, and, and that's a challenge because you engineer to what you know, what you expect, and, and you can't do everything. It's what everyone's been saying, and we absolutely agree. So I think, for, at least for cybersecurity, the key is, as Richard said, and, and we are all in agreement, you have to focus on what's important. Um, and, and you you really secure that, but then you have to watch for indicators, things that you don't expect. Okay, and we, when we talk as inspectors, we ask. I know when I was new to the NRC, I'm a cybersecurity professional, so I did not know nuclear security and safety. And I asked, why would you do that? Why, why did you do this particular con security control? And that's when we were in the prescriptive mode back then. They said, well, because we had to. <laughs> but it, it, didn't, it wasn't based on what they were trying to protect or what the potential threat was or how it, you use those controls together with other controls to have overall secure, security. And, and so we've learned from that. So we're, we're getting better at that. But as we get better than, than on that, on things we know, then comes artificial intelligence. Okay, <laughs> then comes remote access. You know, things that are completely different than what we used to do before. So not only is the, uh, the, there's some issues, and now we have to understand the new reactors because a lot of the react, those meetings for the pre-applications and licensing, I never speak in those meetings. I'm sitting, I'm like a fly on the wall, listening and learning all the time, trying to understand the safety cases for those reactors. So then, once I understand it and I confer with the people in the NRR to make sure I understand it, then I can put on my cybersecurity hat and say, how do I get past those defenses? So it is interesting working in cybersecurity in the nuclear domain because it's just it's a trade-off. It's, it's just what Paul said. I'm, I used to build things. I had my hands on things. And, and we don't have that anymore. At least we compete in like DHS competitions, so that tries to keep our skills sharp and things like that. But a day-to-day -day aspect, we don't have hands-on work. So it's a balancing act. Um, but it's not just at headquarters. Inspectors, they do rotations. They're learning these things. So, but it's an ongoing learning challenge, for sure, that we're doing here. Thank you. Um, next question is for Rich. Um, NEI has developed uh, cyber guidance for the operating fleet. Um, has NEI, or what types of guidance has NEI identified might be needed for support of the advanced reactor development? That's a great question. Similar to the operating reactor fleet, we'll likely need those same types of guidance documents for the advanced reactor fleet, right? As we review uh, the draft red guide that came out uh, from the NRC associated with the Part 53 framework or 73.110 guidance, um, once, that, once that draft red guide is in place, it's highly likely we'll take a look at developing guidance for 
the advanced reactor fleet for implementing um, their cybersecurity program, depending on uh, the types of the types of technology they're looking at, the types of controls you may see, the types of um, performance-based approach they may want to take. And um, I wouldn't foresee going into the world of uh, so many documents, similar to what we did with NEIO 809 and the, the multiple addendums that were associated with it. I think we'll try to narrow it down on the front end. You know, a lot of the work will be done on the front end of analyzing exactly what we need, what's needed to be protected, and then identifying the, the adequate set of controls to, to get there. So we haven't gotten there yet. We're waiting for the NRC's uh, documents to be finalized, and once we do, we'll start evaluating what we'll need from the industry. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing as the time, I'm gonna leave the, this next question for anybody who wants to answer it. Um, but based on the lessons of the last 20 years and the upcoming challenges, uh, what would be your advice for newcomer countries who have no experience with oversight of cybersecurity issues at the stage of design and construction? Uh, where to focus the most resources for the most effect and the most effectively train their staff? I can start. And then I'll just, I'll just open up the door. I would, I would love to see everybody over here, but I can't because of the bright light. Um, so that's why I'm kind of looking over here. But um, I think when you're, when you're, if you're developing the program, knowing what we know now in the current reactor fleet, right, and, and looking forward, if we begin with what the impact of the function is and then what, you know, what the threshold is that's acceptable uh, per the NRC. So if you look at the advanced reactors, we're looking at 25 rem, right? So if you s select your systems, components, structures, if impacted, if their function's impacted and would have uh, exceeded the dose values that are in the guidance, then you've, then you've identified the right structure systems components that need to be protected, right? And then start working backwards. How do you adequately protect those? and keep your focus tight, right? Do your analyzation all up front because the time spent analyzing up front is gonna be a direct correlation to one, positive security and use of resources on those things most important to the health and safety of the public. That's a direct line, we could see that, right? And that time spent on the front end will directly correlate to the amount of time spent on the back end if you have to go back and rework things to adequately protect it because you scoped incorrectly. So I would say to adequately impact your resource use, that time up front analyzing what exactly needs to be protected um, that's directly focused on the health and safety of the public is probably the most important from my perspective. I'll go from there. Jim, you wanna? Did you wanna go next? Very quickly, back to the, the, all the security controls and things like that you have to know or use or whatever. Um, when the advanced reactor program started discussing several years ago, I, someone said, Kim, pick three. Pick, say something about what, <laughs> what you think are the most important. And they are in, actually, Red Guy 571, but I'm gonna highlight them now you have to understand the defensive strategy. You have to be able to explain why you're protecting what you're protecting, okay? Whether you're using security levels, or if you're gonna allow remote access, data dials, whatever, whatever your strategy is. You know, we're going to say wireless can only used in a certain place, whatever, you should be able to explain it. And then understand the architectures that you're building on that will implement that strategy. Number two, have the architecture that will support that strategy. And the last one I would say is least functionality. You don't have to protect it if you don't need to. You, know, you don't want to have a big attack surface. You want to minimize the functionality that you have to protect. Pick the right things, but you protect those things. You don't want the attacker to be able to come in and do, you know, exploit things. So if you un have people who understand the function of the plant, that's primary, you have to have that 
that kind of information, and why you're doing what you're doing in cybersecurity, those two skills together, that will kind of hone in on the most important things up front. So I think what, what I'd start with is what a great opportunity. So most of us, in, in certainly in my organization, we spend our lives trying to retrofit security to an industry that, you know, really predates expectations around modern information cybersecurity. So what a great opportunity to have security at the front alongside all the other aspects that you will consider as you develop things. So I, I look at countries like the UAE and you know, I hear 10,000 critical digital assets on, on some of their facilities and it's mind blowing for an industry with the history of ours. But actually, if you can get in there at the start and you can embed security from the start, isn't that what most cybersecurity people dream of? The ability to embed security from day one. And so there's a real opportunity there, not only in terms of the technical aspects, in terms of categorizing, classifying assets, undertaking risk assessments, determining the value and the importance of assets from day one, rather than trying to go back retrospectively and work out what should we have cared about had we have had the opportunity previously, but there's also the strategic side as well. So actually putting in governance arrangements, um, executive teams to administer your facilities that actually consider security alongside other areas of risk. And I just think that in many respects, that's what we would almost dream of with many of the facilities that we have. So I think there's a real opportunity. I don't underestimate the challenge, particularly with increasing digitalization and connectivity but trying to retrofit, particularly in the OT space, when you've got licensing conditions and arrangements that prohibit things in terms of changes to standards, procedures, and arrangements, imagine baking that in from the start. I know it will be a challenge to maintain it, but I think there's a real opportunity. So my advice would be to, you know, to, to start with a blank piece of paper and think about what's important, what needs protecting, and put those arrangements in from day one as is probably expected in a modern establishment. I want to thank everybody for your time and uh, participating in this presentation. Uh, I want to thank everybody in the audience for joining us for a uh, talk. Uh, should be, a, I think there is a QR code that uh, can be displayed for providing feedback for this session and any other sessions associated with the RIC. So please, if you have any comments um, or questions, provide the feedback. Appreciate your time. Thank you and have a great night.